Welcome to the Influence Industry interview series brought to you by Tactical Tech. We interview experts to understand the technologies, the companies and the personalities behind political campaigns across the world. If you want to find out more, check out influenceindustry.org. Tell us a little bit about the Reporters Collective. You are a co-founder of the Reporters Collective. It's a nonprofit media collective that conducts investigative journalism. You know how the space for journalism in India has been in the past few years. One, both in terms of how legacy media's uh, reportage quality has been deteriorating and as well as there has been a lot of censorship pressure on free media. In fact, if you look at the Media Freedom Index, India features much below uh, many of the countries, developing countries across the world. So that score is pretty low. In such a scenario, I think when uh, many of us, or at least some of us, me and my uh, co-founder, uh, Nitin Sethi, who has been a journalist reporting on uh, environment, finance, climate change issues for several years, we've been working in different legacy media organizations and we realized that space for journalism, which holds powerful uh, people to account, be it government, corporates, or anybody who's sort of responsible for the well-being of people and citizens, holding them accountable was uh, the main purpose, the main objective of journalism in, in any country uh, of this profession, right? And we saw that the space, as I said, for doing that kind of journalism has been increasingly shrinking in India. There have been some newsrooms which, uh, which were critical, say, of people in power and they would point out their wrongdoings, but that would mostly happen through opinion pieces and uh, not through reportage. So the concern that many of us felt was that really good reportage, which is based on facts and investigations, was not being done in many newsrooms. And even people who were trying to do, they were sort of lonely walls trying to do things in their own small spaces. And they eventually, for those individuals, that space was also shrinking. So we, at that point, say about three years ago, we started informally working with each other, bunch of journalists, helping each other do this kind of journalism, this kind of investigation, reading their documents, helping them fact check their articles, suggesting, playing devil's advocate. And this has been a sort of informal collective between many of journalists in different newsrooms trying to do this. Eventually, even that space shrunk and some of us were actually thrown out from the newsrooms for doing this kind of works. We realized that there is, was a need to do this independently as a as a collective and then we started working together a little bit more formally and we registered a trust called the reporters collective there we have uh, apart from me and my co-founder Nitin Sethi we have an editor who has experience of editing in mainstream newsrooms for about 20 years we have a bunch of young reporters and journalists who are full-time again working with us and then we in addition to that, because obviously we work on very limited resources, we really depend on, on donations from readers. So we try and help a lot of journalists outside the collective as uh, associate members. So on the story basis, if journalists want editorial support, legal support, helping in investigations, then we work with them and then we publish their stories. So that's largely the backstory of the Reporters Collective. Actually, our first project was something on the electoral bonds scam the current government came up with an opaque electoral funding mechanism and we sort of investigated into the whole process and how it was flagged by by various authorities within the government that it would lead to dubious funding within elections and the ruling party actually benefits it from it the most we exposed how there were flaws and how it was cleared so that was our first project our objective is that while the space shrinks in other newsrooms and other places, we want to retain our focus on, on the government, on, on the corporates, on people in power, and keep making them accountable through our reportage as much as we can do. Before we get into exploring some of the reporting you and Antara have done on Facebook and Facebook's mis mishandling of the 2019 federal and state elections in India, tell me a little bit, Kamar, about your inspiration or motivation for this piece? Did you feel that there was um, 
a lack of reporting on India specifically? Was it a new kind of oversight that you were exposing in the story? There have been a lot of reportage about Facebook's mischievous doings in different elections in different countries. Cambridge Analytica, then Facebook files in the US, in the UK elections as well. There's been a lot of reportage around that. In India as well, there has been reportage in bits and pieces, but that was mostly focusing on how some of the executives in the India Facebook team, topmost executives were sort of working very closely with the ruling dispensation, ruling political party in India. There have been, there have been reportage about how people in Facebook public policy team in India often help some of the politicians and pages linked to the ruling party get away with hate speech, get away with misinformation. So there's been this isolated reportage in print publications, but there was, I felt, not a similar kind of systematic investigation on how the platform might be sort of in a more systematic arranged way helping the ruling party you know like we have seen in Cambridge and Ilka in other countries in other elections so we wanted to look at what could be the real or actual impact of some of the policy understandings or policy decisions that Facebook's public policy team has taken or just the algorithm, how the business model and the algorithm of Facebook works. There have been a lot of understanding and reportage, even academic research on how that kind of bias of the algorithm might be affecting political, political level playing field in different countries. And our question was, can we look at similar kind of questions in the Indian democratic election space? There is huge influence of big tech, Facebook, WhatsApp, Twitter, on Indian polities. For us, th that was the starting question. That was the motivation to really pin it down to say, look, this could be the really the scale and impact of what might be going behind the scenes. I will try to very briefly summarize some of the high level findings. The headline takeaway is that Meta has undermined democratic principles in India, at least in the context of the 2019 federal elections and state elections over this 22-month period that you analyzed in which um, you and Anthara looked at over 500,000 political ads on Facebook. It's in these elections in which India, I should mention the world's largest democracy of 1.2 billion citizens, elected a prime minister and held these nine different state elections across the country. And the theme here seems to be that Meta was continually undermining democratic principles by giving BJP the incumbent party an unfair advantage. And that advantage played out in a couple of different ways. First, through an ecosystem of surrogate and ghost advertisers, the BJP was evidently effectively able to double their presence on Facebook and Instagram. I should note that according to Indian electoral law, these surrogate and ghost advertisers are actually not permitted. In an effort to control the influence of unknown sources of money, political parties are required to disclose their spending. And what was interesting is that Facebook had previously cracked down on surrogate and ghost advertisers in the context of these elections, but that crackdown appeared to be selectively excluding the BJP and much more targeted at BJP's primary opposition party, the Congress party. And we know from Francis Haugen's whistleblowing that Facebook has been encouraging an industry group in India to encourage the Electoral Commission of India to be less stringent against social media during elections. Another really interesting finding from your reporting is that the BJP, the incumbent party, had been charged less for ads. Granted, this may not be a simple and conscious decision by someone at Facebook choosing to hard code a discount for BJP, but insofar as Facebook's auction pricing mechanism for ads is conscious and intentional, the BJP seems to have an unfair advantage here. There are cases in which entities vying for ads can offer a lower price, and if their ad is deemed to be more relevant to the target audience, Facebook will actually choose to display that ad, effectively subsidizing it in the process. Relevance is defined by many different things, but things that garner engagement tend to be relevant in Facebook's eyes. And we know that divisive content tends to garner a lot of engagement. And, and this is not to say anything about the way in which Facebook executives have worked with the BJP campaign on effectively how to optimize its use of Facebook. Um, and so on the whole, it seems that Congress, the main opposition party, was charged between 30 to 32 percent more than BJP was. And this phenomenon has not been 
observed only in India, the NYU Ad Observatory um, observed a similar phenomenon in the case of the 2020 U.S. presidential election in which the Trump campaign paid less for ads relative to the Biden campaign. Okay, that was a lot at once. Um, maybe is there anything on this collection of reporting, Kamar, that you want to add before we talk about why all of this really matters and what it means for Indian democracy? Let me just close that loop on the summary of the stories. When you have large network of surrogate advertisers and ghost advertisers supporting one party, and in this case, uh, the BJP's visibility just in sheer number of impressions that its promotion campaigns got was doubled by the surrogate advertisers, right? And then the the money that was spent by these surrogate advertisers for doubling BJP's visibility was really not accounted for in the BJP's books. So you have this additional almost double amount of money coming in to promote one party and doubling their visibility. And then what it does is when you have that kind of visibility on a platform like Facebook, there is a snowball effect. The more visibility means algorithm considers the content of what is more visible as more popular. So these surrogate advertisers essentially game the algorithm or bluff the algorithm to believe that by default BJP's content is more popular than other parties because there's this entire ecosystem of ghost advertisers promoting that content. Now, once the algorithm believes that this is more popular, it makes it cheaper. It gives it more subsidies. That means the ability of BJP to get even more eyeballs for less money increases and in competition, the ability of other parties to gain the same number of eyeballs for spending same amount of money diminishes. So they have to spend more and more to get to even closer to what BJP's eyeballs would be. With the snowball effect, the difference keeps becoming bigger. So what eventually happens is the largest party which is able to game the algorithm through multiple dubious ways, including surrogate advertisers, keep becoming bigger and bigger. And the competitors keep becoming smaller and smaller on that platform. You can actually compare the visibility of Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Facebook and BJP's followers as compared to, say, the leading opposition party and its its uh, main leader, Rahul Gandhi. Congress and visibility is pretty less as compared to BJP. But even now you consider, say, much smaller parties, younger parties in different states, which is with, in, in different states and in and, and different regions, which should be the strength of a democracy that, you know, you have a multi-party system. But these smaller parties would never be able to get there. They, those ne smaller parties would never be able to compete because they don't have that kind of ecosystem. So in that sense, the skewing of having a level playing field, at least on the platform, on the meta platforms, Instagram and Facebook, has been sort of uh, skewed tremendously in the favor of BJP, which is very, very damaging for electoral democracy. The, the basic principles of having equal space in democracy are diminished here. In Indian laws and in Indian constitution, that is a very fundamental thing. The whole reason for putting a cap on how much money in election campaigns was to ensure that there is a level playing field and money power doesn't skew this level, level playing field. So that has been sort of violated in this case. And that's how I think it did had pretty far reaching implications. After we came out with this uh, investigations and this report, it was raised in the parliament. There was a lot of reporting around how the opposition parties in the parliament picked this up. But unfortunately, you know how things work with Meta and especially in countries like India, nothing really changes. I see after eight months after our reportage, we, we see that there are ghost advertisers, surrogate advertisers still continuing on platform. This after us pointing out and, you know, there was not even any counter reply or any sort of response from Facebook to counter these findings. Their Meta's integrity team, global integrity team reached out to me to, uh, to get inputs and suggestions on how these uh, lapses could be sort of fixed and how the platform could be improved. But I see nothing of that happening. I don't see any, any of the changes happening. Tell us a little bit about your methodology. I can imagine that there are people who will listen to this who want to replicate or at least adapt some of the work that you've done here in their own 
country. And many of the pieces actually outline some of your methodology. But one of the parts I found most interesting was the identification of the surrogate advertisers, which in some cases seem to be a rather labor intensive process. Obviously, there's a need for this kind of work to be done in a, in a scalable manner. Where do you think that responsibility should lie with Facebook, with the Electoral Commission of India? And yeah, walk us through a little bit of that process of how you identified these entities that had failed to disclose their relationship with political parties. As we are looking into uh, more and more scrutiny about investigations, tech investigations, especially in India right now, there's been a lot of discussions about how journalistic investigations on tech, etc. needs to be more transparent and the methodology should be out that people can replicate, verify, etc. Which I think should be the case with most investigations, not just tech related because Sorry, I'm slightly digressing, but I'll come back to the point, especially with the kind of political atmosphere we are in and the kind of onslaught journalists face nowadays, the kind of misinformation is spread, manipulation of information is everywhere around us. Uh, there is there is a decline in the trust in journalists and journalistic work uh, intrinsically in, in general. And I think the one way to, to really counter that and not let affect good journalistic investigations is to put your methodology out so that others can replicate it. So in that sense, I think this is a very important question. We try to, in the limitation of the space word count that generally journalistic publications and, and uh, pieces have to adhere to, we try to put our way of doing that investigation, our methodology in the pieces. If there is any a more of this work is done, that would be in fact, just amplify the, the importance and the impact of these kind of investigations. So what we did, I mean, to be very credit where due, the idea for this work and idea, at least in terms of the content and the resources that we needed for this work came from AdWatch, uh, Nayantara and Manuel, who are the founders of uh, AdWatch. They came to us suggesting that there is a way to sort of scrape data from Facebook's ad library, which they had already done. They have done it in almost 100 countries uh, by now, which is there on their on their website. Ad Library provides a API, application programming interface for advertisers as well as researchers to sort of analyze how the advertisements are working on, on the Ad Library. Now, the same API can also be used by researchers to download data, scrape data from the Ad Library and conduct their own research. The structure in which that data comes out or could be scraped is not very research friendly. It's very jumbled up. You can't really segregate it properly. So to get around that process, Manuel and Nayantara wrote a code to sort of scrape it in a way which can be easily analyzed on softwares like Excel and CSV and other programming softwares where analytical uh, understanding could be developed on this data. So we chose a period starting three months before the national elections of 2019. And that's exactly the period when Facebook also started differentiating between political ads and commercial ads and started archiving the political ads in the ad library. Now, starting from there for about 22 months to the point when we started our work, we scraped data of all the advertisements that were tagged as political by Facebook's own algorithm. So Facebook tags uh, these different ads as political and archives them in libraries. So we scrape the data of all those. The data has multiple attributes. So say, for example, one attribute is who is the funding entity for a particular advertisement. So you have an advertisement, you have the funding entity of this, you have the page on Facebook on which this advertisement was published. Then you can also get how much money was spent on this ad. There is not a fixed amount, but there is a range that Facebook gives. Similarly, it also gives detail about how many impressions that ad would have got. And it gives from which date to which date these ads were running. It also gives information about which region or which area in the country those ads were shown. Once we scrapped, we have this data for over 500,000 ads. It was about 536,000. And then we sort of segregated these ads by the funding entity and the pages on which it was published. Now, the funding entity here is the advertiser who's placing these ads. And the pages are the publishing platform on Facebook itself on which these ads were first shown. And from there, they spread to other places. 
a lot of times the funding entity is mentioned as the political party so the election commission of india requires all authorized political parties and candidates to get their ads verified by the election commission of india first before publishing them on any platform that's the way to actually prevent any kind of surrogate advertiser so if say a bjp has to place an ad they'll send a formal request to the election commission of india that this is the ad going from bjp and we are publishing it here if the election commission of india approves the content you know it looks at that it's not religious inflammatory it's not misinformation etc once it allows it it goes so the the standard practice is for the political entity to get the ad passed by the electoral commission and then only once they get the green light to then try to place the ad absolutely that's the general practice that's the legal practice that process of getting consent or permission from the electoral commission does not include information about for example whom the target audience is no it won't include the example of whom they are targeted only the content is sort of verified and the facebook also has in its own policies it has said that if a political party or an authorized agent of a political party is placing an ad it also has to submit the authorization letter from the election commission of india so there is a legal way an authorized way for political groups and political candidates to publish the ads which is that they have got their ad authorized by the election commission of india and then they'll give it to facebook and say that okay look this ad i want to place and this is the authorization letter from the election commission of india so in all such cases the funding entity would be the political party or it would be the candidate from the political party so their names will appear as the funding entity so what we did is we segregated all these ads as per the funding entity in in the database and then for all the authorized political party pages so there would be like different units of political party bjp national unit bjp state units like bjp gujarat unit so these different units would place ads and their names would appear then there would be candidates who would also place ads through their own expenditure so their candidates authorized names would appear there what we did is segregated all the authorized candidates authorized political parties into one bunch we clubbed them according to political parties we looked at each of the candidates affiliation and then we clubbed all candidates all political party units and their officially affiliated associations and organizations under the head of those political parties then once we did that we found that there were bunch of these advertisers whose identity it was very difficult to establish so there were a lot of funding entities whose names were not like they were not the names of any organization or the names of any individual some gibberish name in the database of facebook and there would be sometimes website names the link of the website in in places of funding entities and if you click on those website they do not open so there would be so many dead website all these dubious kind of names of funding entities we clubbed them separately and then once we got this one bucket of such names where we can't really figure out who these funding entities are we tried investigating into what these websites are who these uh, people are right sometimes there would be names in those entities now there were different ways of verifying who these funding entities are so one is this data that you download from the ad library others are facebook pages on which these advertisements are published so, and those pages have some information about who is the administrator of these pages and each ad will also have some information about funding entity their contact details their address etc etc so we went to the ads on facebook on these pages and then we looked at these details of who the funding entity is what if there are their contact numbers given if their address is given or try and establish the link of the page on which it's published and see who is running these pages so there would be some information about those administrators some of these websites actually opened at that point which some of them now do not open but at that point they opened but those websites would not give any information about who is behind those websites so then we looked into their code who has registered these websites then tried and sort of investigated into contact details of those people and established links so there were multiple traditional online investigative methods and then accordingly we assigned those identities to all these sort of dubious advertisers details that we found from the database 
we also looked at the content of the advertisements that these advertisers were placing and from the content it was very clear that either they are promoting a certain party or they are sort of disparaging another political party so they are publishing content to diminish the political space for other parties or and accordingly we also clubbed them into whether they are pro uh, bjp or pro congress or pro aam aadmi party or they are against that's how we built these surrogate networks of different parties in many cases actually we could find the links of these surrogate advertisers to the parties for example there were the largest surrogate advertisers of bjp which do not give any public information that they are linked with the party we could find that they are registered on the same address as the bjp headquarter they also had similar phone numbers so we knew that they have connections with the party but in public to facebook and to the election commission of india they are not disclosing that so that their content could be distanced from the political party their funding could be distanced from the political party and that's how we sort of build this network of those surrogate advertisers so that was one part of our investigation the second part was obviously about uh, trying to find the pricing for for the advertisements how that leads to bjp getting cheaper ads than than the congress so what we did is once we had this database and we had clubbed these advertisers try to calculate the pricing so the pricing was imp- uh, impressions received by an ad per indian rupee spent by these parties for each advertisement we had a range of money spent and range of range of impressions got we calculated this uh, advertisers wise and we did this for different elections so that's how we sort of reached at what are the pricings that these parties were offered by the algorithm of facebook i am tempted now to talk a little bit about some of your other work on the aadhaar card system and maybe before we talk about it and its connection to voting it would be helpful to just hear a little bit from you about what it is how it's used in daily life no so i think uh, varun aadhaar is one thing which has been the most controversial tech tool which has been very controversial in the privacy space in india for a while and in fact the journey of aadhaar in some sense has also been the journey of how privacy misuse of personal data uh, personal data protection has uh, evolved in india it has evolved through the journey of aadhaar to give a quick background of what really happened and how it really did evolve uh, is basically we in india have one way that the government knows about its population and its people is through the census so the census has been happening every 10 years in india and these remuneration officers from the government go to each and every household and collect a lot of information lot of data about each household and the individuals within that household now the the purpose of census is very different it's supposed to be the the bedrock for the government and the planning departments of the government to plan their their schemes to plan the governance to plan the resources for the country and surprisingly the census which is conducted under independence era law they had a provision that the census data could only be used as aggregates by any authority or any government nobody can share personal data of individuals or any family from census to anyone so there has been this protection about how personal identities data of people are preserved and protected but in the early 2000s there has been more and more need felt by the national security agencies organizations to sort of surveil who is a citizen who is not a citizen in india so then early 2000s there was a push from the indian government to sort of filter who are citizens and who are non citizens in india and then give them that tag to do that they started to build something called the national registration register of citizens and it was done under uh, new rules that they passed in 2003 for creating that register they started first building a national population register national peoples register which was almost a parallel exercise to the census but in this case there was no protection for personal data right so the government would know each and every individual each and every uh, family what they do how much they earn what their religion is what their caste is so all that data was collected for the creation of npr and that was enforced by the national security agencies in the country 
but around the same time the tech industry in india also saw an opportunity in building an identity based tech and business ecosystem in india so bunch of technocrats in india they proposed was proposed by mr nandan nilikani the whole idea of building a tech based identity card which would register a biometrics yeah, of every individual give them a code and and a number to each and every individual and through that identity number and the data biometric data that is stored in a national database for every individual now in india welfare delivery is huge more than half of our population actually depends on these welfare benefits given by the country so that idea was taken up by the government when it was proposed and they started building this database called national identity database and providing these identity numbers to everyone and collecting their biometric data eventually it got so much buying from the business community in india there was huge amount of business ecosystem that was created around it from fintech companies to uh, telecom to banking this tech based identity became a very easy solution for identifying people and even for providing these identity and verification services several business entities cropped up so you have a huge business ecosystem developing around it using that business community saw a lot of interest in building new and new solutions so then you have edutech companies then you you have edtech companies you have fintech companies and everywhere a system is being built of how citizens personal data can be used to deliver services and benefit from it in early 2010 lot of people social activists privacy activists saw problem in that and they feared that this could create a surveillance state because once you are linked to a technological solution and a database anybody who has access to this database would know what you do where you go where you are moving what you are earning right as well as for businesses to earn benefit from citizens personal data at the cost of the government which is public money so building on the government infrastructure which is built on public money built on citizens personal data private businesses would get profit out of it as and then there was this huge opportunity of misusing personal data for surveillance purposes so the court eventually decided that partly they agreed with these petitioners and they said this yes there is a threat of surveillance they also agreed that business parties were earning profit out of public money and citizens personal data so they restricted the use of aadhar in 2016 to only the welfare delivery schemes and they said for nothing else you can use aadhar without the consent of individuals now you know how the consent in india works half of the time we are not aware what is the meaning of consent half of the time the consent could be just coerced by people and to make things worse the government changed the rules of taking consent they said that if a business entity or a government entity takes consent from aadhar holder to use their data once they can extend on their own the consent for using it again and again for any other purpose as well so problematic yeah so the whole idea of purpose limitation got screwed here and then they also said that unless somebody comes up to us and say you can't use it the consent would be considered given assumed to be granted so you can't even call it consent <laughs> exactly which is against the definition of consent itself the definition is that unless it's an explicit yes you can't assume it so here because it's not explicit no they are assuming that it's yes so that's how this data of uh, aadhar became a very pervasive tech tool to have entered in private spaces of every individual in india and you can't control what people are doing with your data there are rules and regulations but they could be changed or diluted at any point uh, at the whims of the government nobody is going to make anybody accountable and if there is a misuse you a lot of times even don't get to know how your data is getting misused and that's when i think some of our reportage actually showed that there has been tremendous misuse in some of the elections of this aadhar data and it has been kept under the carpet when the issues were raised and it came out it was hushed up and it was completely denied but there is all the evidence out in public that how it has been misused and now the government is actually linking the voter ids of individuals which uh, with aadhar which as i said earlier has led to disenfranchisement of uh, voters and other kind of manipulations in elections 
Tell us a little bit about the unification of these systems with elections. You know how technology and its pervasiveness, intrusiveness really evolved. The understanding of it was lacking and still lacks in a lot of well-intentioned bureaucrats, well-intentioned people in policy circles. The threats of it has really been established and understood in the past decade. So they sold these techno solutions as a solution to all the governance problems and the many of the governments, many of the people in the government bought these and started building these. And eventually they realized the harms of it, which is what the case was with Mr. Manoranjan Kumar, as I pointed out in the reportage. And the problem is there are always goods and bads about everything to ensuring that there are no harms, to ensuring that the good parts are established and it's not misused. You need to have very uh, robust regulations, a framework where harm is prevented. And if there is a harm, then accountability for that harm is fixed. And that's why we need the data protection law. We need privacy laws. In India, the problem has been while you have technological solutions developing at a fast pace in India, you have businesses influencing the government policies on how technology should be used to create solutions, business solutions and governance solutions. You have national security agencies pushing for more and more strict surveillance and tools and laws that could have umbrella surveillance in different spaces. The regulation on uh, privacy and data protection has been missing in India. The Supreme Court, when they delivered Aadhaar judgment in 2016, they asked the government to frame a data protection law. Sorry, it was, I think, 2017 or 18, if I'll need to check those numbers. But it's been almost four years since then. And there has been committees after committees. There have been drafts after drafts of the law. And finally, right now, you don't even have a draft law. They have been scraped. And the government is saying they'll redraft the entire thing. So you never know for another how many years the India would not have a data protection law or privacy law. While these tools have been developed. Now, for all good intentions of social registry, which is actually a 360 database of every individual in the country, you cannot say how the misuse of it would be prevented. There's no framework for it. Somebody goes rogue in the government, a political agent who's also in the government, take, gets all this data and misuses it. There would be no protection. And as, as I said, there have been instances in the past where the ruling political party in different states have misused the data from Aadhaar. There's no, no, no safeguards against it. And to my surprise, I can understand that creating a creating a 360 degree registry while there is already Aadhaar, creating another 360 degree registry and build, linking all the database would take a lot of time. So that's why that's the reason we still do not have a social registry functioning at the central states. So many states have already built social registry through the support of the World Bank. World Bank has been pushing with different states to build the social registry. And in fact, I interviewed in one of these states, a private company, which is building the, the front end for this registry. There are other companies which are involved in the back end of how data is managed, etc. But this company is just building the dashboard, the front end for the social registry. They have the access of all the data of that state for that state. It's unbelievable. And when I ask them what is the security of this data, you know, and what is the surety that this data is not misused, etc. This company is telling me that, no, the data is only used by different government departments on need to use basis. There is no legal protection against misuse, right? So they, these are the kind of things we are seeing right now in India about how these registries are being developed through the use of Aadhaar and other databases. One of the people you interviewed for one of your pieces was talking about how they adhere to a data minimization principle, even though this data system is in, in fact the exact opposite. It's a data maximization mechanism. What's so interesting about what's happening here is that it's, it's very similar to what we have seen in Kenya, what we've seen in Brazil of these kind of national citizen registries being justified under the guise of national security, tech companies who have a lot to gain from having a hand in the deal, and civil society being completely excluded from the conversation. It sounds like there has been a whole like 360 degree profiling infrastructure developed um, that completely circumvents all of this Abhar discussion. So what has happened is because the Aadhaar was entangled in so many legal questions and 
court cases were going on now you have much more sophisticated softwares there are actually private companies work to actually provide customer unique identification of customers to different businesses different online businesses when they do their surveys of their customers and identify what they want at what time they want and they provide advertisements and product services to those customers there are bunch of companies which are working on giving data insights and intelligence about customers to these businesses now the governments have also started using services of these private companies and their proprietary softwares and their ai tools to deduplicate and create 360 degree profiles of citizens for government services without having to use tools like aadhaar so what they'll do is they'll sort of combine all different government databases public private databases and then collect all their data and then identify individuals on the basis of their address name phone number and deduplicate and find unique parameters to attribute to every individual and create these profiles so while there is certain amount of what do you call success for civil society and privacy practitioners in holding the aadhar authority and the aadhar ecosystem accountable through that supreme court case which established that it can't be used without consent for any other purpose but only for welfare you cannot counter so many other technologies which do the exactly same thing that they feared that aadhar would do so there are always more and more these kind of technological solutions and coming up that could do exactly the same thing that aadhar was needed to do and without aadhar they can do shortly after the cambridge analytica revelations went public at the time in the united states there was discussion about the honest ads act The Honest Ads Act was an attempt to bring some more transparency to political ads, precisely to help better understand who's paying for them. I was having beers with this political consultant, and he was saying to me, "You know, even if it passes, here are the three plans I've got up my sleeve to continue doing exactly what I'm doing." And this is very much in the same vein: this pattern of technology being used to circumvent yeah legislation absolutely i i mean i genuinely wonder can ever the regulations be ahead of technology yeah and, and you know i think in some ways it's great that our systems are not preemptive in that way yeah but this fast moving nimble technology and these intentionally slow moving legal bodies mm-hmm. there's a lot of friction there in one case that you report on a private company stole the data of over 78 million residents in two states and then used that information to build a mobile app for a political party what your reporting covers is the way in which people were purged from voter rolls and we often think about this phenomenon of just data hoarding but there's a kind of erasure that happens um under the scenes as well Uh, again because you are talking about how technologies always find ways to to circumvent uh, the legal systems in this particular case uh, explicitly when the states of andhra pradesh and telangana's aadhar data was leaked to a private company which built an app you know, to campaign during elections for the ruling party what happened is when the aadhar infrastructure was being created the aadhar authority at the center allowed the state governments to keep copies of the residents of the, that particular state so every state in india also had a copy of residents data from the aadhar uh, central database now once the concerns were raised about misuse of this data and privacy activist and civil society raised to the supreme court that look how the state governments are making copies of this data and they might misuse it the court asked the state governments to destroy this data hmm. now you know whether this data is destroyed whether this data de- gets deleted whether it's sort of hoarded by someone else in some other servers whether copies are made and copies are renamed and the data f- format is changed and uh, different things is is very difficult to monitor right and that's exactly what has happened in this case this copy of the state aadhar data is what was leaked by the ruling political party to a private company mm. and despite the supreme court order said it should be deleted and then they used it misused for political campaigns during the election and again that brings back to the question of skewing the political competition because in this case the ruling party has access to this data the opposition parties wouldn't have that right and then using its very personal data they personalized the campaign for each and every individual almost like cambridge analytica they had information of what schemes this person is getting benefits from 
they had data of what are their political preferences and accordingly the, the political parties volunteers went to each and every individual and families and accordingly they sort of messaged them the property of the state came to be the property of the ruling party and that's a massive problem when this line between the temporary occupant of the state infrastructure the incumbent party and the infrastructure of the state are blurred i think you know it's particularly these data intensive infrastructures like this that are so worrisome because it's precisely in cases like this in which si- simply the access to that kind of information can massively skew a party for example for example to maintain a stranglehold on power can prevent any other party from having a chance at acquiring power and that's a complete antithesis of what these democratic ideals are about If you enjoyed today's interview and you want to find out more about the influence industry, data-driven political campaigns, and anything else about tactical tech's work, check out influenceindustry.org.